So today we have the privilege of uh, documenting and examining a couple of original um, Viking Age weapons here in the Archaeological Museum in Hamburg. And um, Arthur is measuring at the remnants of a Norwegian Viking Age sword. The blade of which is um, broken. That particular sword was acquired by the museum in uh, the late 1800s. So here's a catalog showing that particular find that was probably um, bought. It was not actually, the, the, the museum staff uh, were not actually the excavators of this these things. They were acquired and um, as you can see in this book, here the sword features a much longer blade and um, it was actually a fake blade that was attached to the original find to make it look more appealing in the showcase during an exhibition. So this is something that comes as a surprise to many people <laughs> but it actually happens quite often partially because you have to restore these things and make sure that they don't decay any further. So various forms and types of resin are often, um, do you, no, you say resin, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> resin is the, um, the stuff you can eat. <laughs> it's the fruit <laughs> that you can eat. Okay. So, okay. So they're not working with raisins. <laughs> they're working with various resins to restore these things and um, stop corrosion. But um, for quite a while, it was like almost an art form to restore them to such a state that uh, they almost look intact. And of course, um, this is not something that is very um, helpful if you want to replicate and examine these weapons. So which are the measures that you're actually taking right now? Uh, there's quite a few, so I'm, I'm measuring, you know, just across the three dimensions, the, the width, the height, the depth. Um, I'm also paying particular attention to places where we have rust formation, so trying to differentiate between sort of the expansion of rust versus potentially parts of the blade that are true versus parts that have some rust away. Um, hopefully I can go back and do some calculations to get sort of a confidence level of what the original thickness of the blade was. And that might also help inform a little bit more about what this original thickness would have been moving down mm -hmm. through here. A mm -hmm. uh, nice thing is for you know a good majority of the upper guard as well as the lower guard, uh, we still have the inlay on both sides. Oh yeah, that's uh, so true. So we have a good indication that I mean that that would be almost exactly the same as original thickness. This is a particularly beautiful um, inlay here. Yeah, it really is. There has been some discussion um, about whether this is lead or pewter or actually silver because I mean uh, you do see these tiny bubbles um, and um, Ingo suggested that maybe this is not actually silver um, because for silver to melt it requires such a high temperature uh, so he thought like maybe that was... Uh, what do you mean to melt? Like well, yeah, I mean, yeah, liquefy because I mean these bubbles apparently they must have um, they must have occurred somewhere later. Um, I'm pretty sure that during the life of that uh, of the sword, um, those bubbles, those those bubble, uh, this was all polished, so that would have been all smooth, right? So so the um, bubbles that come out um, may have been produced during a burial pile, something like that. Oh, I see. So what it you're looks, it looks, uh, looks a bit molten, right? And um, I'm pretty sure that uh, the original surface was uh, completely polished. Right. Uh, you know, it's always hard to say a little bit in terms of, you know, as as the iron potentially rusts away. Um, you know, iron will rust, silver doesn't. Mm. You also have different wear patterns in terms of uh, how durable iron is versus how mm. durable silver is. And so you'll, you'll tend to have kind of these raised ridges and things like that. The other thing too is if you think of the inlay process, so you create a groove in the metal, yes, right? And 
you're not likely to have like this perfect consistency of a groove mm -hmm. and then you undercut that groove mm -hmm. right and if if you look in some of these even under the microscope you'll see that there's a lot of irregularity in their groove right i mean it's sure. done by hand so yeah, yeah, you're, you're naturally going to get this so now if you think of these sort of levels of silver you have a thin layer of silver that's visible and mm -hmm. you have kind of a mushroom underneath mm -hmm. and depending on the particular channel these will change size and all sorts of stuff now imagine you start to eat away some of the top surface and expose mm -hmm. some of the I understand undercut. what you mean so yeah. you know you'll start to see sometimes some of these what look like almost bulbous spilled effect mm -hmm. is really just some of the iron has disappeared from probably what was a uh, okay the original part of the the groove mm. So that's where you end up with some of these irregularities. Um, not to say that it wasn't potentially part of some fire as yeah. part of the funeral process, but that does explain a lot of mm. where all of a sudden you'll see a strange what looks like a defect, but in many cases it's just an issue of it's no longer a nice flat mm -hmm. surface. Mm -hmm. um, something has deteriorated over time. Mm. The pommel cap is missing, so that means that we can, uh, with this sword, we can see um, how the tang uh, was peened and uh, see original pommel construction in as far as um, the pommel bar is still there and uh, still sports these um, particular holes. If you could just lift it up a little bit and show the holes in the, yeah, in the pommel bar. So these were the ones that the rivets passed through that secured the, uh, the pommel cap, right? Correct. Yeah. And then uh, we see the peening of the tang, although it looks like there's some kind of paste or something like that that was uh, put there uh, somewhere during restoration. Yeah. Um, and on, on top of the tang, you know? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, so, so we can't really see the original, um, the original peening very well. Yeah, it must have been a really beautiful one, and um, it's uh, it's probably the one sword with the shortest uh, handle that I have seen so far, given that this is the original length of the handle. But um, right. if one just um, holds the the pommel, then um, if you just finger the pommel and grip the sword from pommel upwards, not from cross guard downwards, then um, it's sufficient space, isn't it? Yeah. So this is this is a interesting size handle. This is similar to uh, uh, there's another find that has a similar size because this one I think in in uh, what is it? It's just under three inches. So yeah, it's around seventy two millimeters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really short. Now let me step on the other side again. Yeah, it's surprisingly short, but um, still it can accommodate my hand if um, I think about the pommel as being an integral part of uh, the handle rather than neglecting and ignoring it. Well, the other thing too that I think plays a little bit of a role here is, you know, when you move out to the side where it's kind of out at this angle, so you're at Closer to 78 millimeters on mm -hmm. the one side. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. And then over here, that's where you get kind of down to the 71, 72, mm -hmm. even as the guard mm -hmm. flails out. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, it it uh, could well be that this is actually um, quite ergonomical or orthopedic almost. Yeah. Shame we don't have the pommel cap. Yeah, it's beautiful though. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'm going to give our viewers a little idea of the original design of the on the pommel bar because I've already drawn that. So you can see that's a very typical typical Viking Age ornament with these spirals and interwoven braids. Is that Yellinger or is it already Mummin style? What would you say? I don't recall how hmm. to classify the art forms. Okay. Yeah, and as you can see, there's a lot of 
Uh, a lot more most interesting stuff here like currently I'm in the process of drawing this axe and then over there there's a sax waiting with most of its organic handle still in place and here we have a 10th century shield boss waiting to be taken out of the box and cared for with love and examined. <laughs>